morning. Welcome to worship at Harvard Avenue Christian Church. We're so glad you're here in the sanctuary with us or in your sanctuaries at home. Wherever you are worshiping today, we hope that you are blessed by the opportunity to be together in the presence of God. In your worship kits in this space and below the video at home, you can find a connection card. You can find an opportunity to give and a chance to be part of our children worship and wonder and worship in their way with their words. We also know that you have communion here and we hope that you have found communion wherever you are worshiping today so that we can share later in this service at the Lord's table together. We are so grateful to continue to hear stories of vaccination and movement and hope. What a gift that we have been given through the miracles of science, through the modern miracles of healing. We are so thankful for all who are making this possible and all who are taking advantage of the opportunity to move us further together. Thank you for being in worship today. Remember what it means to listen. This is a chance for us to listen to the voice of God speaking to us wherever we're worshiping, whether it's the person next to you, the person in front of you, or simply the spirit moving inside of you. May you be inspired by God's presence today. Friends, will you join me in prayer? Good and mighty God, we come here in celebration of your life-giving love. The wondrous riot that we see around us in spring, all of its newness of life and color engages us in a conversation about the blessing of your creation, the power of your touch. We recognize these same actions in our own lives. The ways your mercy Joy, grace, and redemption make our souls spring to life and blossom into their full beauty. We ask this day, God, that you renew within us clean hearts. We also ask that you renew within us a sense of compassion, of caring, the passion for truth. Lord, our lives belong to you. And so then to our prayers. And we lift up this day the prayers of our hearts. We pray for our friends and family who are leaning on your sure strong arms this day as they deal with illness and sorrow. We pray for all those in the world who suffer from oppression that they might know the ways in which you call us forward into freedom. We pray for our own hearts as the daily challenges of our lives grind and threaten to harden those hearts or plunge us into despair. Lord, fill us with a sense of hope for all the good work that you are doing in our lives and in this world. Fill us with your hope. For you, O oh God, are one who always makes a way for your people. So may we find ourselves connected to that good news this week. Use us to your glory. Transform us into your apostles, instruments of your gospel for all the world. We pray these things in the name of the risen Christ, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to leave in your presence. Fear has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to leave in your presence. Fear has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to leave in your presence. Fear has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to leave in your presence. Let the spirit rise up, break the walls, beat down the door. Let me say it again. Good morning. Now I'm turned on. I have power now. We're, we're going to be looking at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. Let, let me tell you a little bit about Matthew before we uh, do the reading. In Matthew's Gospel, you'll find two primary sections of teaching from Jesus. The first, you will find the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 through chapter 7. And the beginning at chapter 13, Jesus begins to teach in a different way. He begins to teach parable, in parables and stories. And in chapter 13, there are multiple parables uh, that Jesus tells and explains. And we could actually spend probably uh, four or five weeks just looking at each and every one of these parables. Today what we're going to do, though, is we're going to look at one that's very familiar to us. The parable of the sower and the seed. The setting in this part of the gospel is that Jesus is encountering more and more resistance to his teaching. Uh, in fact, even from his own family. His own family is attempting to persuade him uh, to change his direction, to come to his senses. Uh, he's receiving objections and opposition to the things that he's teaching. And so in this parable, he's going to give us a story that will tell us something about the character and the heart and the love of God and also give a reason why he's experiencing opposition from those who are listening to him, and particularly, in particular, uh, the religious crowds around him. And this is how it begins. It says, That same day, Jesus went out of a house and sat beside the sea, in such great crowds gathered around him that he got in the boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen. Listen. Now, I would ask you just to underline that word in your Bible, to mark that word. As I began to prepare this message this week, that's the word that popped for me. Because I'll be honest, I completely wanted to avoid this parable. This is the one of the six I wanted to leave out because I have preached the parable of the sower so many times. I have a box full of sermons on the parable of the sower. And how many of you have heard the parable of the sower and the seed? Raise your hand. We've all heard it. And we're very familiar with it. 
And it's really easy to just sort of go on autopilot when it's read. Oh, this is a good chance for me to get out a piece of paper and make my list for the things to do this week. Yeah, I got to start on my taxes. We need milk and eggs and bread. I'll pick it up on the way home. Got to mow the yard later. Got to get all that stuff boxed up out of the closet, get it over to Goodwill, clean out the closet. Um, Got to get my expense report done for work. It's really easy just to check out, and me too. I mean, I got a box full of sermons. I could just reach in the file and uh, September 19th, uh, 2003, pull it out, put it up here. But when I read the text today and I saw that word listen, I, I heard this voice inside of me say, Don't prepare a message, receive a message. Receive what it is that God wants to give us through this story. The beautiful things about the parables of Jesus is that they meet us in real time. They meet us where we are, and they speak into our lives. And every parable does not have a fixed meaning. They have multiple meanings, multiple different ways we can interpret them. And these stories help us interpret our lives and help us look at our lives in new ways and give us a sense of who God is. And so one of the things I realized as I was preparing this message is that I should probably pre- preach on the parable of the sower every week. Not every week. That would be too familiar, wouldn't it? But, but at, least, at least once a year or every other year. So listen. That, that, word, that word listen is not just something written in black and white on a text, but it is the real-time voice of Jesus in our present life and moment. Listen. And he says, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then he adds again, let those with ears to hear listen. Now, for a minute, what I'd like for you to do is I want you to imagine in your mind this crowd of people that are standing on the beach looking at Jesus and hearing him tell this story. And when you look in their face, what do you see? Well, what I see is confusion. When he tells the story, they're not familiar with this story, and they would have been troubled by the story. They have puzzled looks on their faces. And I can imagine that someone turns to someone and says, Well, obviously, he's never been a farmer. He doesn't know anything about farming. He needs to stick to carpentry. I mean, because what kind of farmer just takes a bag of seed and just throws it everywhere? You see, in first century Palestine, seeds were scarce. They were a very valuable resource and a valuable commodity. My preaching professor at Vanderbilt, Dr. David Buttrick, uh, who passed away a few years ago, Dr. Buttrick said that there were at least two occasions in Israel's history when they had to float alone in order to import seeds. So the idea that you would take something so expensive and so beautiful and something that gave so much life and just throw it everywhere made no sense. I mean, even a child knew you don't throw seeds onto a path. You don't know throw seeds on rocks. I mean, we've got a community garden out here. We don't take seeds and just throw them on that gravel path, the walking path. We wouldn't do that. That makes no sense. And so they're looking at Jesus and said, okay, he's made sense to me until this point, but now this story just makes absolutely no sense. So what kind of story is this? You see, when you read a parable, you've got to look for the things that are surprising elements in the story. So what is he trying to teach us with this story? What he's saying is that God is like a bad farmer. That God is like a farmer who just takes his seeds of grace and mercy and throws them everywhere. On everything and everyone. 
That that God's love is inexhaustible. That God's grace is never wasted. That every single person, every single life, every single living thing receives receives the seeds of God's love and unconditional grace and mercy. He just pours it on. And that sack of seed is never emptied. It's always full. And he's always pouring out the seed. But you know, stories do shape our lives and we've been, a, we've been sold a different story, right? The story that we've been sold is that we don't have enough. That we have to be careful where we sow our love, where we sow our mercy. That we have to look for the best places to plant our hearts in the world. We have to look for the right people, for the right things, for the right places. Uh, We live with a scarcity mindset. We focus on ourselves. We focus on me, what I need, what I have. we we got to save for, you know, a rainy day. But that's not the teaching of Jesus here. And, And we see it over and over again in his life. We see, remember that episode when Jesus was on a hillside with a bunch of people and the disciples say, hey, they're hungry. You better send them off down to the cracker barrel because we don't have enough food to feed all these people. And it's getting late. And Jesus looks at him and says, well, you feed them. Give them something. Well, we don't have enough. All we have is just these two loaves of, two fish and five loaves of bread. Give me what you have. And then Jesus teaches them abundance. He, He just passes it out and there's enough for everyone, for the whole crowd. And the word in the text is that they were satisfied and there was enough left over for everyone I mean what if we lived with that kind of grace what if we lived with that kind of abundance what if we lived that way that we just gave away our love gave away our grace we just shared it with everyone and everything and we didn't withhold it what if we lived with that kind of imagination in the world Now, the disciples at this point look at Jesus and say, and I'm going to give you the Dave Emery paraphrase of it because it's a complicated um, thing, what he says here. They say, why do you teach in parables? He says, because some people have already made up their minds. They don't listen. They don't want to hear. They've already got the world figured out. They've already got God figured out. And I tell these parables because these these parables or stories are meant for people who want to understand. That people, for people who want to see. And the mystery of what God wants for the world are locked up inside these stories. So if you want to hear, you'll hear. If you want to see, you want to see. But if you don't want to, you will never hear and you'll never see. And then he says, these people, they have hard hearts. In hard minds, they don't see. And their minds and their hearts are dull and hard. Now, I think it's important that we pay attention. Who is Jesus speaking to in about in this text? He's talking to the people who should get it. He's talking to about the religious leaders, the religious folk, those who should know God best, those who teach the Torah, those who are religious professionals. And and maybe as we look at this word, maybe we need to look at our own selves and ask, have we become so familiar with the teachings of Jesus that we are dull in our hearing? Do we want to listen? Do we want to hear? I I saw a report that came out just this uh, last two or three weeks ago that said religious membership in the United States in terms of church, church membership is dropped below 50% for the first time in American history. Now, there are a lot of factors for that. A lot of different reasons we could give for that. It'd be really just easy to say, yeah, people are unfaithful. People don't love God. People have just walked away from the church. And we could point at young people and say, they just don't care. They don't listen. But maybe it's not those who've walked away. Maybe it's because we have forgotten the principle of the sower 
Maybe it's because our hearts are hard. Maybe it's because we look more like the world than we look like Jesus. I heard Rick Warren say this last week, that he's saddened by the fact that many Christians in the United States today, that their identity does not come from Christ, but it comes from other places. He threw out one, like politics, or personalities, or ideologies. But what would happen if, if we, the church, if we who call ourselves followers of Jesus started to listen and started getting inside these stories, and what would happen if we started to live the parable of the sower? And we just started giving away grace and love everywhere we go. Now, I'm not going to read the next part of the text, because, uh, but you can read it on your own. And you already know it. This is how the sermon is usually preached. Usually the sermon is preached as the parable of the soils. Because Jesus explains it and says, well, the reason that people don't welcome the seed, the seed doesn't grow, it has everything to do with the human heart. Some hearts are hard. And the seed just falls on the path and never takes any root. Some hearts are rocky, and the seed doesn't take deep root. And so when persecution or hardship or difficulty comes and the sun hits our life, because the, the, the seed has no roots, it doesn't grow deep, and we walk away from our faith. And then he says, some hearts, however, are just troubled by thorns. We're choked out by worry and busyness and life. And so the seed can't grow. And this then says sometimes, sometimes our hearts are good soil, and that's when it produces great growth. Now we've heard that so many times, but it's a good question to ask, what is the condition of our heart? Are we listening? Are our hearts hard? Are our hearts rocky? Are our hearts thorny? Or are our hearts good soil? But you know what, as I, as I read that this week, and I, I went back to the word, listen, you know what I decided? I just, it occurred to me that at different times in my life, my life were all four of those types of soil. There are seasons in my life when my heart is hard. There are seasons in my life when my heart is thorny. There are seasons in my life when I'm rocky. And sometimes when the seed does take root. Sometimes things grow, sometimes things don't grow. I mean, it, it all depends on when you catch me at what time in my life. But you got to go back to the beginning. Because, folks, this is the good news. That's why Jesus just keeps throwing seeds. Because God is persistent with His grace. Not only is that grace abundance and reckless and outrageous, but God just keeps throwing it and 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 eventually it catches you at the right place and in the right moment and begins to grow in you. And when the seed begins to grow inside of you, great things happen. Just a little bitty seed grows into great things like love, kindness, faith, hope, and peace. I mean, think about the people in your life. I mean, you've got thorny people in your life. You've got hard-headed, rocky people in your life. What if you loved them the way that God loves you and you just kept throwing seed on them until one finally took root? And usually what it takes is some sort of heartbreak in their life to break open the soil of their life. And then that seed just hits them at the right moment and begins to grow. Or maybe you're in a toxic workplace where people are just difficult. Maybe you can't do anything to change their behavior, but what you can do is welcome the seed into your life and let it grow in you and see what it does. The, the same too with your family. Now I know it's easy to listen to a sermon like this and think that it's all pie in the sky when you look at the world we're living in. It's easy to think that, you know, this kingdom is not going to grow. Those seeds are so small. I mean, just look at the headlines from the past couple of weeks. The suffering, the death, the injustice, mass shooting. I mean, you, you pick your 
headline. And you would think we're the most wealthy nation in the history of humankind. We're the most educated nation in human history. We have more resources at our disposal than any, human, than any group of people in human history. And yet we are literally tearing ourselves apart and we can't even agree enough to make the decisions we need to make to change the world we live in and to end some of the things that make us look like barbarians to some parts of the world. You look at that and you think, the kingdom's not growing. But I want to point out something to you, the most hopeful part of this text, because this sower just keeps sowing the seed and is just so incredibly relentless, God is not going to give up until the seed grows. And there are examples all around us, all around us everywhere, where love and kindness and faith and peace is growing, and we can't give up. That's the beauty of this parable, is that the kingdom is going to come. The kingdom is going to grow, and we can build our hope and confidence in that. Let me just take one little part of it and show you what I'm talking about. So you know, when that seed falls on the path, and the bird picks it up, Jesus must have been laughing on the inside when he told that part of the parable because the bird eats the seed and at some point, because it's biologically necessary, deposits the seed. So it looks like the seed's not going to be planted, but instead it's taken off the hard path and it is planted somewhere else. I was in my backyard and I was looking this last week at all the acorns on the ground and I was wondering how many acorns does it take before one acorn tree is actually planted? I mean, they're, they're everywhere. You, you would think as many, or, I mean, there'd be acorn trees everywhere. I mean, there'd be oak trees everywhere. I mean, thousands and thousands. How many, how many acorns does an oak tree have to toss out before one oak tree is planted? I don't know. Then I remembered a story. I remember that we had an oak tree at, in our, at our home and it just tossed off acorn after acorn after acorn. And then one year when I was small, smaller, a little thing sprung up in the backyard. My dad put a little thing around it and wouldn't let us cut mow over it. It was about this big. And do you know where my mom will be this morning? My mom this morning will be watching the live stream service sitting under a bench underneath a huge oak tree that the one acorn produced and grew. You know, Jesus, Jesus Christ himself is the seed, is the word of God that came into the world. And God gave his love to the whole world. And the whole, what did the world do? The world took him and killed him and put him in a deep, dark hole. But then on the first day of the week, that beautiful seed, that beautiful Word of God walked out of the grave and continues to just toss out the seeds. And so Jesus says, let those who have ears to hear here. Listen. Well, I'm excited today because we are finally cleared to sing as a congregation uh, behind our masks still, but I can't think of a better song to lead off with than one about God's great love for us. So if you wouldn't mind standing and singing with us today, the melody is really easy.
before I spoke a word. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. So, so kind to me Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found Leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all. Mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Do you believe?
be seated. Perhaps in the days and weeks to come, we can listen for ways to be less about the soil and more like the sower. It's the parable of the sower. We claim in the Disciples of Christ Church that we are a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. And as our general minister and president, Reverend Terry Hort Owens, will often remind us, what if we were the church we say we are? What if we were that movement? What if we were the extravagant love of God in the world? What if we listened for ways that we can be, not just claim, but be the limitless love of God in the world? We come to the table to remember what has been sown in us, but also to remember that we were given the responsibility to sow God's love into the world as well. We come to receive the gift of Christ, gathered with his disciples. He took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, and he passed it among them and said, drink of this, all of you. This cup is a new covenant, and the promise that I make with you is that your sins are forgiven. So eat of this bread and drink of this cup and remember me. For these gifts, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to the table to share these emblems of the bread and the cup and give thanks for Christ's death and resurrection for our own redemption. Lord, may we listen. And as we live our lives, use us not only to sow seeds, but prepare our hearts to receive those seeds intended for us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Family of faith, everywhere that we've gathered, in this room and in sanctuaries all over, we are receiving the gifts of Christ. And so we are given the gift to sow back into the world. Won't you receive and then go and be the limitless love of God? Won't you join us? It's your birthday. 
We're so glad you could be here today to worship with us here or online, and we hope that you'll continue to participate with us as a community of faith, listening to the Word of God, seeking what it would have for our lives so that we may receive those gifts but also share them with the world. That's a way of saying every day is an invitation to discipleship, and if you're looking for a place to carry that work out, we hope that you would consider making this a place. Feel free to talk with David, Courtney, myself, one of our elders, we would be happy to speak with you more about what it means to be part of this community of faith and pray for that journey with you. Most importantly, as we go from this place, we hope that you will find that space to receive the good word that God is trying to plant in your heart and you go forth in Christ's name to spread that good news the world over. May it be so, this day and always. Amen. Amen.